Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences Next Gen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps toolchain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. Effectively securing your organization and its reputation requires a smarter approach. To maximize efficiency and minimize risk, security experts turn to Logarithm, the only leading solution built solely for security teams by a security team committed to your success. With next-gen SIM, user and entity behavior analytics, network traffic and behavior analysis, security automation and orchestration, and compliance, Logarithm provides security made smarter. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to Enterprise Security Weekly. If you're attending KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, you can join Matt in Barcelona. Uh, what a better place to, to go hang out in Barcelona, right? Uh, yeah. May 20th through the 23rd, you'll be there for SysDigs. Um, what, what are they calling it? Cloud the, the Native Transformation Summit. Hosted by SysDig, and uh, Matt will be emceeing the event. So make sure that you add that to your registration for KubeCon and Cloud Native Con. I'm awesome. there less. I think I'm only on the ground for like 48 hours. Wow. So I don't get to enjoy too much of Barcelona, unfortunately. Right? It's one of my favorite cities, but I... I, I it's so in, interesting uh, in this segment, um, many of you, and I want to start with the redundancy protocols, right? Because the first thing that you might consider when you're implementing an enterprise, air quotes, enterprise level firewall is some type of redundancy protocol. Um, I think it's fascinating, even just on the Wikipedia page, which has... Uh, you know, some references, you might be familiar with HSRP, hot standby redundancy protocol, if I get that right, hot, hot, did standby I get that right? routing protocol? Uh, no, hold on. It was, I had it. It was in hot standby router protocol, uh, HSRP. Also there's VRRP, virtual router redundancy protocol, and then the open source implementation of those due to the history and Cisco enforcing patents and coming up with its own protocols. Uh, they developed CARP, which is Common Address Redundancy Protocol, uh, which is kind of an interesting to understand some of the background there. And it's a fascinating read how Cisco's enforcing of patents caused all these things. Uh, the BSD operating systems implemented CARP, PFSense, which is the open source and commercial, uh, of course, OpenSense is in there too, right? But the open source uh, PFSense operating system uses CARP, which is the uh, redundancy protocol that is, in fact, open source. So we, in I've done some VRP and HSRP stuff before, a lot largely from the security side. Like if it doesn't implement encryption and protect its secrets, if you can become the preferred router in that uh, in that protocol, you can intercept everyone's traffic. It was one of those fundamentals that we learned. CARP does use uh, encryption and authentication. Now, uh, th I, th that. I think the listeners have to know why you have to use CARP because I won't let you buy Cisco devices. Well, yeah, <laughs> so the firewalls, and I'll, I'll talk about the hardware um, uh, a little bit. In fact, I'll show it. So the, the, the problem that was presented to me was we need to be more enterprisey, if that's a word, enterprisey in our firewall implementation, right? So like what we do here in the studio is more like internet is mission critical, right? We're bringing people on for webcasts and other shows. So we need to make sure that we have some redundancy in our internet. We're also pushing some pretty huge files back and forth, uh, really up to the internet on a regular basis, basically every day of the week. Uh, so therefore that process can't slow down or we get behind and, and bad things happen. And so, you know, if you, if you work in enterprise security today and you've done anything with firewalls, you're gonna get a, obviously a lot more functionality by spending forty thousand dollars for firewalls, which you know I mean, you can spend forty thousand dollars or more, Plus. 
Yes. Tens of thousands of dollars or more on enterprise firewalls, as many of us know. You, you obviously get a lot more functionality in terms of inspection all the way to layer seven and provisioning users into different groups and you know Palo Alto, uh, Cisco, Junipers of the world make firewalls, tens of thousands of dollars or more that, that can do that. Um, and a lot of people are going that route. Now, what one could say is in the new world of security app user data, maybe that's becoming less of a thing, although people are still using firewalls for those enhanced next generation uh, capabilities. But when I embarked on this project, I was like, this kind of mirrors a lot of things that you know are still challenges in the mm -hmm. enterprise. And I'm like, what I built cost like less than a thousand dollars. And I'm like, I got a lot of features here that are, you know, getting us pretty close to what people are spending, you know, for, and obviously there's enhanced features there um, that maybe are not replicated or with some work you could get closer, but it's nowhere like a Palo Alto, right? That's yeah. not what I'm saying. I mean, at the end of the day, we're still a single location. Sure. We don't have to worry about multiple sites per se, right. which some enterprises do and need to manage across multiple Mm -hmm. environments here it's the studio right this for us it's yep. it's about connectivity from the studio making sure we can bring people in so our implementation doesn't have some of the nuances of a multi-site deployment mm -hmm. yeah and we're also not supporting tens of thousands of users either right although i am pretty impressed at the the bandwidth so we have a gigabit connection we've got a 150 meg connection and as far as capacity goes for that, in terms of bandwidth, not necessarily sessions, right? Because there's not, ten, you know, fifty thousand people behind, right. uh, you know, these firewalls. In in terms of that bandwidth capacity, um, I was impressed versus you know five ten years ago, right? Um, so those are just some things to uh, set up the segment. Um, first, I want to talk a little about the uh, the hardware. I think, is my laptop connected? Are you able to see my screen or do I have to do a... a just, all right, so if you want to show my screen. Oh, all right, hold on. I got um, to mirror it. Hang on one second. We'll fix that so that we can mirror it and... Now you should be able to see my screen. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So uh, the first thing I wanted to show was uh, I bought these firewalls, the hardware on Amazon. And they're made by Kotom. They, they, I believe they shipped right off the boat from China, like literally was on a slow boat from China to get here. So say what you will about Chinese having back doors in our firewalls. Uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to buy a firewall that doesn't have some type of electronics and or chip that was manufactured or assembled somewhere in China. Yeah. Um, you know, these are roughly $300 uh, a piece and uh, a core i5 with eight gigs of RAM and a 16 gig SSD and four gigabit ethernet ports for like 300 bucks. I was like, that's really good. Um, and again, you know, the throughput was really good on them. And, and we get Chinese malware embedded so we can do other Analysis tests in the Analysis on Chinese malware. Uh, they also have the AES NI chipset, which was a, a hot topic when PFSense said they would only support, uh, at some date in the future, they're only going to support firewalls that have this particular chip. Now, when that was first announced, the hardware was a, a lot more expensive. Now the costs have come down. Uh, you know, this could be for a remote site or, or what have you. Um, again, uh, enterprise, um, um, it's posed as a question in very air quotes, um, but does have similar features. And this particular hardware platform uh, was, was really good to solve this problem. Um, I think it was the Logarithm, uh, Greg Foss, uh, when he was at Logarithm, uh, turned me onto this hardware platform. And then like years later, I, I looked into it. I was like, wow, I can get like a decent firewall for around 300 bucks. It's got uh, four ethernets and that helps me solve my problem. So there's a link uh, if you wanna buy them. Again, not from an enterprise level, if you're looking to build firewalls at home or if you've got developers or administrators- Maybe that remote offices home. or something like that yeah. where you need a firewall, but you don't wanna spend tens of thousands of dollars to do it. These, these are good firewalls. They support a lot of different protocols that you could integrate into other things, such as point-to-point -point VPNs. There's documentation on how to do that. I'm not there yet 
We have the infrastructure in place. Well, but I you have, and I both have. Yeah, so I have one at home I haven't hooked up yeah. yet so that we can do a point to point from right. my studio in Colorado. We haven't done that yet. So yeah. at some point we'll have to figure we'll that do configuration. Some further, you know, future segments on there. Uh, for software, I'm using PFSense. I have to say I did try uh, OPN Sense or OpenSense. Uh, I found there to be a lot more bugs in that platform than PFSense. There's this whole like Reddit thread and trash talking between the two projects. I mean, if you're really interested in that, you can read about it. Anyway, I did PFSense. You can get commercial support from PFSense <coughs> on these firewalls, which is, again, one of the reasons why we're presenting it on this show. So our, um, I didn't obviously put like all our IP addresses on there, so I've changed all the IP addresses. It's all, you know, RFC 1918 addresses in there. But essentially, you have two firewalls with two, uh, physical boxes here in studio. Um, one is firewall one, one's firewall two. They're directly connected, so you burn an Ethernet uh, port for the high availability sync. And and really, that's a, a PFSense uh, special protocol. There are probably some open source protocol that they've adopted to do that. In any case, it just it basically transfers all of the rules and states or sessions from one firewall to the other. Again, enterprise grade firewalls from the major manufacturers have had that since the beginning of time uh, to sync over all of your firewall rules and existing states so that when it fails over, conceivably your connection still flow because the state table gets synced. We do that over a physical cable. It's not recommended to do that across another network. So you burn uh, an ethernet port on each firewall to do it. Uh, and connect them with a cable. You give it an IP address on each one, and you tell it this one's primary, this one's secondary. The config was very easy, very well documented. It was one of the easier tasks. So now you get two firewalls that can sync the rules and states between them. Uh, then the question becomes if, okay, on the inside of the firewall, how do you automatically do that failover, right? Um, and also on the outside of the firewall, if each one has its own internet connection or each firewall has, is, is crossed so that you have two internet connections, two firewalls on the outside of the firewall, firewall one and two are connected to each internet provider and in, in both cases, right? So there's uh, two internet connections on each of the firewalls. Um, there's a lot, and then on the inside, you have to provide one IP address for your default route for your users. Now, there was lots of things I looked into uh, to do this, which is why I spent some time in the beginning talking about CARP, because that's the easiest, simplest, straightforward solution is to just use basically, you know, that, that address uh, protocol, CARP, HSRP, VRRP, um, that essentially they are for one IP address. You could use BGP, you could use OSPF, and there were some other, it escapes me at the moment, we talked about them on Paul Security Weekly, some layer two protocols that you could use to accomplish those goals. In your enterprise setting, you might be considering some of those things. You may already have BGP or OSPF set up and basically, um, you know, it's the, a weighted routing protocol and, and that's kind of what you need to accomplish this goal. To avoid all of that complexity, PFSense does support uh, an open source implementation of BGP and OSPF. Uh, to make that simple, I just use CARP, right? So inside there's, uh, you know, the dot one uh, default gateway um, and the various firewalls will use CARP to, to ARP for that address. So you have a primary uh, and a secondary. So uh, that's why I solved the problem. Again, you can use more advanced <coughs> routing protocols if you so choose, although I talked to Joff about this. I talked to Doug about this. Some of the other hosts that have experience in networking. We kind of all collectively agreed that for this use case, that was the best, the best option. Your mileage is going to vary. So that's the inside. It's very easy to configure uh, your CARP addresses on PFS. I mean, you go into the, the GUI and you, you configure it, and it's like you plug it in, give it a password, and and you're off to the races, basically. You set one at dot two, one at dot three. You tell them both that your virtual address is dot one. You give it a password, and uh, you're off to the races. So that's the inside. The outside gets a little more complicated. Uh, in our case, I one of our I, so we have two ISPs, right? One of our ISPs, I have two external addresses. Uh, actually, you need three, so I have three external addresses. So you can do CARP on the outside. 
Um, if you're not going to do that, again, you're going to have to adopt a routing protocol to make those routing uh, decisions. Um, so what I've done is on our firewalls for the ISP where I have three addresses, I'm using CARP, right? Um, which makes it very easy. For the one that I'm not, that's just hanging off the primary firewall. So it has two ways to get people out to the internet. So if we lose one link on either firewall, well, yes, on either firewall, uh, it should be fine, right? Uh, it may need to fail over, right? So if, you know, one firewall is connected to our provider two, like in the example, right? Like if that fails, that firewall is going to go, I have no way out to the internet and it's going to fail over to the other firewall. If the other firewall, which has two internet connections, if that one goes down, it's got two ways out. So it doesn't need to do a full uh, failover. This is much better if you've got two internet connections and each firewall has a connection to each one, right? And you're using CARP. So you've got three external addresses to work with on each provider. That would be the better way to do that. Examples of that actually exist in the PFSense uh, documentation on how to configure that. Again, pretty straightforward. And that's primarily because you have a budget limitation and getting three addresses on the other ISP was probably outside of budget. Um, I think so. Future for Security Weekly, we're looking at, uh, actually, these are the same provider uh, today, just mm -hmm. different, uh, different drops, right? Uh, different pops uh, coming into the building. So we're going to, uh, when the contract expires, get a new ISP. So we have two different, different providers. providers. And then from each of those providers, we'll need three external IP addresses. We're going to price that out and see what that costs, uh, and then have a much more resilient kind of setup like right now basically we have to lose an entire firewall and one of the internet connections at the same time like the firewall has to like burn or not work or shut down or melt or whatever and one of our internet connections has to have issues before we have to manually go start moving cables around right which right. i mean the chances of that happening are not uh, you know not out of the realm of possibility but the worst case in that scenario is I got to go move some cables around. Uh, losing any one of those things, I don't have to move any cables around the way that we've got it designed today. Um, and the way that you do that in PFSense, uh, again, we avoided using any kind of um, <coughs> routing protocols like BGP or OSPF, um, is PFSense gives you the ability to create gateway groups. So basically, if you've got two ways out to the internet, you define those external gateways, you give them a weight or a tier, as you can see I've done in the config here, um, and you give it an IP address on the internet to essentially ping, and there's a background process, it's actually a pinger, it's a BSD process that runs, it pings, if it can't ping out via that gateway, it'll mark the gateway as down and make corrections accordingly. It'll basically automatically reroute the traffic. So it's an easy way for us to have that level of redundancy. And so I created a couple of different gateway groups, right? Because now one link is a gig, one link is 150. I wanted the ability to route traffic based on basically a policy-based route. So our system that publishes those gigabit files to the internet, you can have it prefer the one gigabit link. If that link goes down, you don't want them to be down completely. You want to fail over to the other link. Um, so that's what these gateway groups are doing. There's one that basically gives both connections the same <coughs> weight, which is good for general redundancy. There's one that prefers the gigabit link, and there's one that prefers the 150 link. So now in policy, I can set which gateway that traffic goes out and do some policy-based routing, as you see below. One of the issues that I had was a lot of connections, SSL especially, <coughs> does not like to be split. Now, even though, you all right, Matt? You know, it's very, very, uh, it's, it's making you all choked up talking about firewalls. Um, so, protocols in general don't like to be split. In other words, in this setup, if I'm weighting both gateways with the same weight, conceivably, traffic could go out one internet connection and come back in the other connection and many protocols, especially SSL, really hate that. What you'll see is on your outbound, that response traffic could be dropped because it lost track of the session. 
uh, and again, I think this is one of the things that maybe are more commercial uh, firewalls they've got a better solution for, or maybe you know they they still do have this problem. Um, but in PF sense, that that could be an issue. Now there are uh, configuration options in, in PF sense to make it sticky, right? To say if traffic leaves through one interface, always send it back. Again, you can accomplish that with OSPF, um, which would probably be a better way to to do that and ensure that. But in this case, uh, it's based on some of the intelligence. It's basically a checkbox that says sticky connections. When traffic leaves through this interface, it should always come back through this interface. Even with that, you still could have some dropped uh, connections, which is probably the only complaint that I have in this uh, particular setup. So I've configured uh, you know, certain things like go to meeting in Zoom and done the research, like what ports they use, <coughs> and said always oh, send them out this link unless it goes down, of course, and then it'll switch it over to the other link. And we did test that too. And in fact, Skype or Zoom will, if one of those firewalls goes down, it, it doesn't, uh, it might miss a couple of packets, but it, it comes right back. And we did test that. You did, cool. yeah, I, I know you tested it because you were like unplugging cables to see if we still had Wi-Fi connectivity and other yes. things to see. Wi-Fi is a different over. issue. And I, I'm a huge fan of Ubiquity, but I, there's I, either something wrong with our setup or it just doesn't, Something there's some issue with Wi-Fi. That'll be a future episode once I get that figured out. Then I've also balanced uh, DNS servers as well, right? Like I've got internal DNS servers, so some uh, like a set of those will be load balanced and prefer one gateway, and the other set will be load balanced and prefer another gateway. Now either connection can go down, and those DNS servers will still be resolving. But it gave us a lot of redundancy in that we could lose multiple DNS servers and an internet connection and a firewall and still have DNS name resolution. Not so critical for necessarily the shows where you've already got an established TCP connection for Skype, Zoom, or GoToWebinar because it doesn't need to do name resolution after that, we hope. I mean, it, it might, but uh, usually once that uh, connection's pinned up, you're good to go. So that's kind of the high level of how we accomplished some enterprise level features. I don't want to say, uh, you know, enterprise level functionality across the board, but some enterprise level features with a very small budget, right? We're probably under, we're probably about around a thousand dollars to implement this with hardware and zero software licenses. Just my time to install, P which PFSense is a breeze uh, to install. Uh, there was some configuration time to, you know, configure the rules and other things like that. Um, but it, it got us some enterprise level features without, <clears throat> you know, your single security systems and network administrator having to worry about maintaining a BGP or OSPF <laughs> uh, on your systems. It makes it easier for other people to maintain. If you got other people working in here, interns or others, they can more easily understand it without having to be an expert in routing protocols, which gets a lot more more complex. Well, in your enterprise, you have a team of networking yeah. people, and it's that's okay. And but that, if you don't, uh, but if you don't, this is an alternative to that. If you've got, let's like Matt was saying before, you've got remote sites, and the on-site person is the system network security administrator. This is a much easier setup for them to uh, maintain and troubleshoot than having to be woken up at three in the morning because somewhere in Belgium, you know, there's some kind of routing issue and you've got to, you know, go fix that. Yeah. So um, I, I think that, it, again, in an enterprise setting, you're using routing protocols to uh, accomplish this. And I think it's a much better solution. However, it's a lot more costly and, and requires some more overhead. And in, in this is an alternative uh, that works for us today. So. Yes, all under budget all well under budget absolutely and the throughput is great on them yeah we well. haven't had any issues with throughput throughput is good yeah. session handling is still something that i'm troubleshooting and there'll be probably some more segments talking about how to how to troubleshoot that probably on paul security weekly um so that still is problematic which is probably why if i had to to do it again or the next incarnation will probably you know use uh, a routing protocol uh, to accomplish this. But of course, those aren't foolproof. I mean, anyone that's listening that's a network security engineer knows you've spent some time troubleshooting routing protocols as well. So that's it. That uh, All of the links, uh, by the way, are in the show notes, wiki.securityweekly.com. This is episode 137 that is now 
coming to a close. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.